Good morning, good morning. Um, we welcome in October, and uh, the as fall starts to settle on us, uh, all of our trees are starting to really turn uh, uh, different colors very quickly. Um, and, you know, the reminder that it's going to get cool here fairly soon, and, and uh, winter will be upon us pretty quick, which is always really fun to think about. That's about the time you'll go back to Arizona, right, when winter hits us, you turkey. Yeah. You want to say that again? <laughs> that didn't sound right. Man. Say it again. I'm high. I'm 72 and higher than my low. My low is right now is 70. Okay. Okay. Show off. Oh. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Just rubbing it in. I don't think so either. I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got the statement. I'm just trying to work it out in my own mind here, man. It's just and you know my mind. You know how I just kind of bounce around in here, man. Has it been um, a long day already? Yeah. He'll <laughs> yeah, get it yeah, later absolutely. today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ding. All right. Um, welcome to Granite Lake Community Church. For those of you who are watching live stream, welcome. Um, uh, take some time today to uh, reflect upon our walk with Christ, uh, to be able to um, come to him humbly as we're going to celebrate communion today. And, and I've skipped over the church of Smyrna, and I'm going to dive into Pergamum, and I'll get back to Smyrna later. Uh, but I did want to, when I read uh, about the church in Pergamum, I just think it fits with what we're doing today in terms of our relationship with Christ and then communion, okay? So I skipped over Smyrna. I'll come back to it later. Uh, but uh, let's pray. I'm going to lift up our nation, uh, our president, who is battling the same thing that lots of folks have been battling with. Uh, I've got some good friends that uh, were uh, tested positive that had to stay home and quarantine. They seem to be doing better. Um, We've got uh, people whose lives and families have been devastated by it uh, with loss, uh, with uh, financial constraints, and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to pray over all of this stuff uh, and, and our relationship with Christ as our main focus. Okay? So let's pray. Father, we uh, come before you grateful, grateful for the many blessings that are in our life. And so, uh, Father, I know at times like this it just feels hard uh, to see what those blessings are. But again, as your word says, that when uh, we take the time just to reflect, to, pee, to be still and know that you are God, when we do that, Father, it's easier to see the blessings that are in our life. And we are truly blessed, God. Uh, so, Father, I, I thank you for the time that you give us today to be able to open up your word, to worship who you are, to celebrate communion, to reflect and remember from where we've come from, what you saved us from, and what you provided for us, and that's everlasting life with you. Lord, I lift up our president and all the leadership that's with uh, this administration, particularly those who have been uh, uh, have tested positive. Will you lift them up and ask for your healing hand upon them? And ask God that you continue to guide our country towards you and you alone. Think of all the families who uh, worldwide, and particularly our country, but all, all across the globe, whose families have been devastated with loss of life, loss of uh, of, of homes, I mean, I think of fires, I think of earthquakes, floods all over this place. And God, there are lots of places in which the devastation is, is just incredibly powerful. And yet you remain, and you are our focus. So Father, we lift them all up to you and ask God that your healing hand be on them. I think of my wife Jennifer, who's recovering from another surgery. I ask God that you heal her up and strengthen her as well. I think of my friend Jeff, who's in the hospital, who had a stroke yesterday and fell downstairs and had bleeding on his brain. I praise you that he's awake this morning because he was out for three days. Help his family. Use this as a time to draw him to you and his wife. Lord, I, I pray today for our service time. Uh, God, that you would be glorified, that you would be blessed by our time, by our songs, by our thoughts by our time in your word. Make us more like you. Change us today, God, from what we are right now as we leave at the end of this time that we would be changed and made to be more and more like you. Father, we love you. We thank you. And as we stand to worship who you are, may you be blessed by our time. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>
nothing. <laughs> I was waiting for her to say something. She goes, uh, I know. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> okay. I really do try to preserve the holiness of everything <laughs> that's happening up here, so I need to just move <laughs> along. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, really quick, since we're all here, <laughs> we have a birthday girl among Yay! us. <laughs> uh, and so I'm just going to say this really quick. It is her 13th birthday. Sorry. We've had 13 years of having her tell us what to do <laughs> and being the boss of us all and um, also giving her dad makeovers, which she is amazing at makeup, yeah. if anybody knows. Mike's never looked prettier. He never looked prettier. <laughs> and he's so willing, so that's so sweet. Um, and weird. And weird. <laughs> yeah, a little weird. Anyway, yeah, we're going to sing happy birthday. Did you want me to move along? He's <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. No, this is a good one. You guys, I can remember a time. I'll tell you what. This is really quick. I can remember a time when this whole gig up here was like everything. everybody was uptight, and we had to, like, do the songs one by one by one and do this. And you know what? Over the years, I've mellowed out, and I've thought there has been – it's been hard to relate to you guys in the audience when there isn't like that human, human moment. And so for me, I don't, I, it's not like I'm not trying to be holy about this or anything, but I just want you guys to know how much I love you and I love being here. And if, if I seem irreverent, sometimes I'm, I promise you, I'm not being irreverent. I really, I do love Jesus more <laughs> than life itself, but I also love you guys. And this is how we live. And you know, life is, life is about the funny and the happy and the mm -hmm. sad and um we need we need it all mixed in we do we need jesus we need jesus here and we also need each other so please don't ever take my moments like <laughs> i'm walking out i cannot believe she is not like super <laughs> holy because maybe i'm not right at this moment but i really do love jesus and i feel like it's a privilege <laughs> to be here and it's a privilege to work with these guys Sorry, I'm going to get wordy for a second. It's a real big privilege to work with these guys. And my last thing is, let's sing happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Sure. Happy birthday. I feel like we could be like Christian Saturday Night Live or something. <laughs> the church lady? Church okay. Lady. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Gracie, happy birthday to
I don't know if you remember, but just before Kim uh, gave her message this morning, do you remember what the first thing out of her mouth, what she said? She said, I got nothing. <laughs> but God had other plans, right? God had other plans for her to share this morning, man. Um, I'm going to invite the kids up. Uh, we'll pray over them. And as they come up, I just want to say that yesterday was a, a blessing to uh, do the walk for the uh, Life Choices Clinic. They uh, have a new building uh, that uh, is, is going to serve them really well. One of the churches in the valley raised, I think it was $18,000 um, for uh, some equipment uh, that they need. Uh, and it was really cool to, to, there were probably, I don't know, two, 300 people there. Uh, but it was nice to see so many different folks there and, and uh, an opportunity to walk for our future, uh, to have an opportunity to support uh, a ministry that's vitally important to families. Uh, to not just young people, but particularly to those who are uh, caught up in decision-making about what's going on in their life. And so um, it was fun. Anyway, let's pray over our kids, and uh, when then we'll send them off with Miss Carrie. Okay? Father, we uh, are grateful for the many blessings in our life, God. Again, uh, the way in which you trust us with children is a mind-boggling thing, that you give them to us to raise up raise up in full knowledge of who you are, to do our best to let them see examples of who Christ is in how we treat one another. Father, we ask that you bless them and strengthen them and their families. Help them as they go downstairs to deepen their relationship with you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. Going that way, right? Kim, preach on. Jesus. 
Um, as Tony said, we had a, an offering, I think it was either Easter or the weekend after Easter, uh, in which we had a fairly large donation came our way, and $1,000 of it was earmarked for specifically the homeless ministry. You also need to know that this church uh, family opened its doors for um, the first step group to come in and do some training uh, on folks who are interested in counseling, folks who are coming out of addiction, and folks who are coming out of difficult circumstances. And so uh, I agree with Tony, this church rises up uh, in many different ways. Um, if you've noticed, we did not take a, an offering because we stopped doing that, but there is a tub in the back with um, right in that little cubby back there that uh, is for offerings. So when you leave, if you, between now and then, you feel led to uh, write a check or specifically uh, identify some money for first step, you can surely drop it in there. Buzz will collect that uh, and make sure that it uh, is Tony's notified and inform that, um, that that offering was there for them. So um, thanks, Tony. I appreciate it very much. Um, we, uh, I'm going to pray first. Yeah. Father, um, we just want to say thank you uh, for the blessings that are in our life, uh, Lord. We lift up uh, these various ministries like First Step, like the, uh, the Choice Clinic for uh, Life, um, different things that are taking place, God, that we are busy with, as well as other churches and, and what they're doing. I praise you that uh, the church that raised that 18 grand to pay for um, medical equipment for that clinic, uh, Lord, that you nudge them in a powerful way, uh, Lord, in the same way nudge us to be aware of and to take care of those in need, uh, Father, and, and not to just ignore. Uh, Lord, we uh, ask that as we get ready to open up your word and uh, again explore the message to each of us as believers uh, from the seven uh, churches out of Revelation. And that, God, you would change me, you would mold me, you would mold all of us so that when we leave here, uh, we are empowered to live for you to a world that needs it, to a world that needs people to care, uh, to encourage, to come alongside, to love well, uh, and, and to be able to represent who Christ is. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said earlier, I am going to uh, skip over the church at Smyrna. I'm going to go into uh, the church at Pergamum. So if you want to, you can turn to Revelation chapter 2. And real quickly, I'm going to go back and just uh, cover what Ephesus was all about. And I uh, also want to say thank you to Lewis for stepping in for me last week. Um, it was good to know uh, that he was here and that um, it allowed me to be able to take care of some things that um, were starting to press in on me from work. Uh, as well as our home, um, and um, just helping to take care of, 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 of family in certain ways. Uh, so I appreciate that, Lewis. Um, the church in Ephesus, they received commendations uh, from Jesus as being a hardworking church, uh, a, a church that adhered to strong doctrine and teaching and, and endured hardship because of that. Uh, the concerns that were listed and weighed against this particular church is that they had left their first love. As we're going to talk about with Pergamum today, it's not that they, this church in Pergamum leaves it. They ended up drifting away from the truth of Christ. It says here in, in Ephesus that they left their first love. Okay? This church, and Satan, one of Satan's strategies is to uh, reduce a church to religion, and ignore relationship. Um, they created a cold-hearted people who knew the word, but weren't living it out, weren't loving others well, weren't caring about other people well. Uh, and the promise that they, uh, that they were given, if they would heed, if they would remember and repent, if, same message that's in every one of these churches, today we'll see it again at Pergamum, and that is to repent and turn away from that and strengthen that which was once there. And that is a love, a passionate love for Christ. I likened it to the relationship of Jennifer and I. And I'm going to use that again today in terms of being um, madly in love with someone and, and uh, caring for them and uh, worrying about them, being concerned about them. And then over time, there are, there are moments in which you just kind of get tired of one another. Those of you who have been married longer than a day or an hour may know what that's like. 
that you look at the other person and go, man, what's wrong? You know, I mean, it just happens. In the church that we're going to talk about today, it's more of a carelessness in our relationship with the other person rather than a purposeful uh, leaving. So today what we're going to look at is this whole aspect of um, Pergamum and who they are and what happened to them and, and how Jesus is described, their commendations, and yet what it is that Jesus has against them. Pergamon is a very wealthy city. The church that was written, or the letter that was written to this angel of the church in Pergamum, the church uh, and the city of Pergamon was very, very wealthy. It was actually the, the capital, uh, even though the Roman governor lived in Ephesus. Um, it was the furthest north of all these seven churches, about 100 miles north of Ephesus. It boasted an altar to Zeus, as we're going to read about here in this chapter, uh, about this church in Pergamum. It had... Uh, the throne of Satan in it, which was a real throne. It wasn't just a seating of teaching. It was an actual throne. Satan's throne was there, uh, which tells you that Satan had some serious influence, just as he does today, not just in our country, but throughout the globe. It also uh, boasted an incredible hospital and a school of medicine. Okay? The worship uh, of temples or gods and goddesses included temples to Dionysus, Athena, Apollo, Aphrodite, and three particular Roman emperors. And the interesting thing about Pergamum is that the root word of Pergamum is Pergamus. Pergamus means much married. Much married. In other words, multiple relationships apart from the real relationship with Christ. Okay? This is a church that had uh, uh, compromised its relationship with Christ in order to survive, in order to be okay, in order to be able to eat. And as we're going to read about what it is that they ate and what it is that they allowed from the, the, the surroundings, the church that was surrounded by all of these pagan beliefs, the church of compromise. It's funny that um, in the 1880s is when this throne of, of Satan was discovered. It was uncovered on an archaeological dig. And guess where it rested for 100 years? East Berlin. I find that very interesting um, that it was there. Um, so in Pergamon, we're going to start in verse 12 of chapter 2. And um, let's listen for how Jesus is described, the commendations for this church, as well as that which... Jesus has against them. It says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teachings of Balaam, who, keep, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Thus, you also have some in you, uh, some who in the same way hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Jesus is described as the one, as it says right up there in the very first, the one who has the, sh uh, the sharp two-edged sword. In other words, Jesus is the one who has the power to come in and wound, to come in and pierce, and to try to create and move an unbelieving and un or disobedient group of people to come back to him to hopefully bring about repentance. The commendations of this church is I know your circumstances of where you live out your faith in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of a pagan society. You hold fast to my name, he says, and you did not deny my faith, even in the face of death. He says it held to teachings of Balaam and Balak. Balak was a king of Moab. Balaam was a prophet who was uh, not an Israelite, so, uh, basically a false prophet. And together what they did is tried to create enough social and legal 
restrictions on the Israelites for food, for living, for all those things that kind of come up with what we take for granted, and said, you can't do anything unless you start to do what we ask. And those are pagan beliefs. And slowly but surely, they began to eat food that was sacrificed to idols. They had to eat. They had to find a way to be able to feed children. And instead of saying, well, we're not going to do this, God, they said they rationalized and compromised that it's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. It's not that big a deal. And along with that came in more pagan beliefs, sexual immorality, temples that had prostitutes awaiting people to come in and offer things so that they could have sex with that particular prostitute that was in front of this particular temple. Because they had compromised and had a very careless life attention or focus or purpose on their relationship with Christ, they drifted. I've told you many times that when Jennifer and I moved here, it was because I had drifted away from my primary responsibility and my blessed gift of loving Jennifer. I thought I deserved something different. Four children and a beautiful wife who loved me, and I thought I deserved something different. This country doesn't think it deserves to suffer, and I'm here to tell you they'll suffer. It's suffering now, and it will continue to suffer as the rest of the world does. We are asked in this particular thing to remember where we've come from, remember what he saved us out of, and find and recapture the love that drives your movement towards loving others well. And that is only from Jesus Christ. They had drifted far out to sea, the sea of wilderness, so to speak. They were lost and in trouble. With this church, what became more important was my comfort, my belief, not scripture, not the truth of Christ, but what I think is real, what I think is true, and the, the comfort that I need to have. They preferred that comfort over aligning and following Jesus Christ. So, as we're going to read in verse 16, or we read in verse 16, the very first word in that verse says this, repent. That's the, that's the, uh, uh, the directive of all of Scripture, is to always remember that we drift. We all fall short of the glory of God, and we all need to repent. We all need to repent. So that we might be able to be in line, but more so to enjoy the incredibly blessed life with Jesus Christ. To keep our eyes focused on him. And it says, what, what's, if we read that same verse, it says, repent therefore, or else. <laughs> that's, that's a powerful statement. Or else. If we don't repent, if we don't return to the way in which we live our life with Christ in a relationship, not a religion, there's an or else attached to that. That can be scary. Th th those of you who are parents, parents of two-year-olds, parents of teenagers, <laughs> parents of adult children <laughs> like me, you get pushback. Anybody ever say, you better do this or else? I love listening to people, and, and uh, I, I go into a lot of different buildings for school and stuff to observe my interns, and there's a lot of them that have given a lot of leeway. They'll say, all right, if you don't get sat down in five seconds, there will be a consequence. Five, four, three. Two, one. I'm at one. I'm almost to zero. <laughs> warning after warning after warning. And then they'll move on and not everybody's seated. Not everybody's ready to go. Compromise. We will, God, uh, Jesus is warning us in this to please remember and repent or else. Heed it. Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of prophecy and heed the things that are written in it, and listen to them, and respond to them. And this real repentance, I, I'm reminded of a story from Scripture, and it's after Jesus has denied, compromised his relationship with Jesus. Jesus has been arrested, and Peter is trying to follow, and Peter is confronted. You were with him, you know him. Not just once he compromised that relationship, but three times. And it got progressively more aggressive to the point in Scripture where it says, and he cursed and said, I don't know this man. Compromise breeds distance. 
compromise and rationalization breeds uh, a very big vacuum of the loving capacity to love our Savior and to love others well. It says in there that uh, in Luke chapter 22, it says, And the Lord turned, and this is right when um, Peter had denied Jesus. It says, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. That is the picture of grief, of realizing how far I've drifted. And I don't like being here. I don't want to do this. I don't want to deny you. I don't want to have that distance in me. But it takes that real repentance. In this case, Peter was stricken with deep aspects of grief from having compromised, from having rationalized, for having put self over a relationship with Jesus that involves sacrificial living, thinking of others. Remember, turn back. It begins with humility. To know who we are in Christ, what we are called to do, what, how we are called to live our life out. If you want to keep, keep your finger in, in Revelation and turn back to Romans chapter 15. And this is a, this, these are um, six verses that um, outline a little bit of what is expected of us as Christians, which is why I think compromise comes into play, why I think rationalization comes into play, because this is a, this is a passage that's all about living selflessly for others at the expense of myself. Verse 1 of Romans 15 says, Now we who are strong, and the only way that you and I can be strong is by prayer, by time and worship, by being in his word and allowing it to saturate our mind and our heart, by being in fellowship, even at a distance, by respecting others and living for others. It says, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. That's the key part for us today not just today in church, but today in our society and in our world, is that we are called not to just please ourselves, which is exactly what this church in Pergamum was doing. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to his edification, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach thee fell upon me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to the Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. What I get from this is that we are, as, as I mean, if you ever enter scriptures that's about serving others, you will be inundated with a ton of scriptures. We are to be about the business of others and considering others as more important than ourselves. That is at the very heart of why most marriages end. The very heart of when relationships turn sour is that it's about myself. That's almost what turned Jennifer and I's relationship into a dead end. Fortunately, I have a God who worked with, through us and with us. Fortunately, I was at a church that had men that held me accountable. Fortunately, I was in a, in a relationship with a woman who prayed even when she despised me. We, as believers, are called to be sacrificially focused on others. I've mentioned this a couple uh, weeks ago, but in that passage it says to <laughs> do things for the good of your neighbors. You all have good neighbors? Or I might be the only one that might not have good neighbors. I actually am surrounded. Jennifer and I are surrounded by good neighbors. There have been times in which some of those neighbors, not the ones that are there now, were the neighbors that were from uh, another place. Okay? And it's hard to love. It's hard to think about what can I do for the edification of them. But it takes nothing to drop off a basket of food to somebody. You don't have to spend time with them. But to drop off some blessing, to, to be able to be praying for someone. And, and here's the hard part. I had a nice conversation with someone last week that was struggling with a relationship 
uh, of another Christian because they weren't demonstrating Christian behavior. Um, and I said, uh, and, and, and really questioning whether they wanted to go to work or not. Um, and I said, when's the last time you prayed for that person? Uh, huh. I don't remember the last time I prayed for that person. That aspect of praying for that other person releases your heart, releases your heart greatly to be able to love them okay, to help them, to be an encouragement to them. You and I are called to be involved in a ministry that looks to encourage and strengthen those who are weak and who are in need. That's what we're called to do. We need that today more than ever. We need to think about others more than ourselves. And it's hard. I understand that. But it is important that we remember that Jesus went to the cross not for himself. He didn't want it. How uncomfortable was Jesus on that cross? How uncomfortable, how much pain was he in? I'm just going to say this. This is not painful, y'all. This is not painful. We do this to think of others first. When we put ourselves first, we place at risk other people. One of the promises that comes to those who really listen to what Jesus says in the message to Pergamum is that they would receive the hidden manna and that they would receive a white stone and a new name engraved on it. This new manna is the bread of life. And as we read in John chapter 6, Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life. Not just to sustain the physical body, but to be much better than that. And that is to sustain our heart, our mind, and our soul. When we repent, when we listen and obey to what he says in this passage, and all through, all through scripture, is to repent or else. But in case, but instead of thinking of it as or else, repent and see what you receive. And that is you receive hidden manna, which is in direct contrast to what it is that they were eating, which is food sacrificed to idols and living a life that, in, that involved pagan rituals and sexual immorality. Yesterday, as I walked with that group for the clinic, I had conversations and prayer time with several folks. And, and there were some young, young folks there. Uh, by young, I'm talking about uh, 50. <laughs> Just kidding. Although I do think that from time to time. These are teenagers and young 20-year-olds. The teens were a little bit nervous about walking through town, holding a sign. They were nervous about doing that, somewhat scared about what might happen. What do you think people will do? As we read in that last passage in Romans, those of us who are strong are to encourage and help those who are weak. I was with a, a guy who used to pastor Lutheran Church here, Jimmy Higgins. And as, he share, as, as these two kids were talking to, to he and I, we just said, let's pray because we are here with you. We will not leave you. We are called to be able to find ways to encourage, and we cannot do a, we cannot uh, love well and be strong without this hidden manna, and that is Jesus Christ and an intimate daily relationship with Him. The other thing that we're given is a white stone. In ancient Greece, at the end of the trial, the jury would give a verdict, and it was either a black stone or a white stone. Black stone meant guilty, white stone meant innocent. Given them that aspect of forgiveness. And it's receive a new name. And what this basically means to me is that with that stone, the stone of forgiveness, the stone of grace, that says no matter how often you sin and fall short, does not, a, does not provide us with a free license to sin. It's a free gift to go back and start over again with our God because of his sacrificial life. And to be made innocent again by his sanctifying grace. It's an expression of the fact that Jesus is pleased, that white stone, that our God is pleased with us and wants us to understand that we are a new creation. 
Whatever the meaning of these two gifts, it involves being humble, it involves admitting our sin, even if he knows what it is, and he does, and finding out how careless am I with my relationship with Christ. We have lots of people who drive carelessly on the roads. Anybody ever guilty of driving carelessly? We put everybody at risk on that road at that moment. We put whoever's in our car with us at risk. We put people in front of us who are at risk. We put people who aren't, should not be put at risk at risk. We do that also when we are careless with our relationship with Christ. Purposefulness and a time to be able to say, God, you are God and I'm not. Let me repent, confess my sins, turn away from what I've been doing and come back to you. As we get ready to receive uh, communion and take communion, um, Kim, are you get, do you mind? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to take some time just to examine um, and think about what it means to be careless, what it means to be careful in our relationship with Jesus Christ. When you, gave, when you said yes to one another, or I do to your spouse, you would spend a number of times, uh, a number of weeks, months, years, or whatever it might be, wooing, okay? Doing everything right to earn that love, to get that love from that other person. You were careful about how you related to that person. You were careful about your relationship building with them. Anybody remember those times? Then when you say, I do, the further you get away from that moment of I do, the more careless we can get in our relationship with our spouse and in some cases with our kids. And that carelessness breeds and creates a vacuum that can only be eradicated by coming back. It took a long time for Jennifer to trust me again when we moved here. It took a long time for the waters to get smooth. Why? Because the water was very turbulent, but I didn't have my eyes on Christ. I had it on everything else. But the only way to get back to that is to turn, return, repent, and turn back. You and I are called to be strong for others who are weak, to think about the needs of our neighbor, to think about the needs who of, of people who are weak. I love walking yesterday because it's for those who don't have a voice. And it was for people and young families as well as older families who don't have the resources in some cases or the ability to make a decision that is different than what the world says. We're called to come alongside and encourage and think about others, not just myself and what I think I am all about, my comfort. So today as you get ready to have uh, uh, communion, those of you who have never had this, this communion here, we went to this when, um, when the COVID hit uh, so that we can avoid lots of transmission and lots of interaction. And that is that there are two elements in here. One is the, is the wafer, so very carefully pull back the very top layer because there's two little pullbacks. One of them reveals a nice little wafer. <laughs> I've said this before that it reminds me of going back to Catholic school and having this little wafer. So you take this out. I'm not going to wait for everybody when you get this. Go ahead and go back and sit down and be with, your, with whoever you're here with and take that time to have the communion eat it and then you peel back the next layer please be careful as you peel this back because as you peel it back you could get grape juice all over if you okay just carefully take it back and then take a cup let's close our eyes father god you are such an incredible god you love us in spite of what we do in spite of how we act in spite of how we much how much distance we create between you but also with others. Lord, it says to repent and to turn back. And as Peter realized that the moment that you looked at him, that his compromise was big, 
His rationalization was hurtful. And he wept bitterly. I don't remember the last time, God, I was moved to be weeping bitterly because of my relationship or neglect of my relationship with you. Father, we come to you this morning wanting to be reminded from where you have saved us, the depths and grip of hell, and delivered to life eternal because of your sacrifice, not because of anything I've done or we have done. And Lord, as we take this time to just pause, each of us in our own little moment, that God, you would expose to us our compromises. You would expose to us how we have drifted. And you would cause our hearts to desire to be close to you and to repent. Because your word says that when we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us so that we might eat of the new man, the hidden manna and receive the white stone. A lot of Christians, Father, walk with what they think are white hearts, but they're darkened by sin, by neglect, by selfishness. And in order to get that stone of forgiveness, Father, you require us to repent. And you cannot wait for us to do that because you don't like the distance between us and you. So God, I just uh, pray for each of us today that as we take a moment in time to do so, and we grab onto that forgiveness, fully holding onto that forgiveness and not letting go of that forgiveness, that we might be changed and made more like you. Father, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When you're ready, go ahead and come on up and, and uh, grab the element uh, cups and take them back to your chairs and um, have communion together, okay?
thank you, Jesus, for today. God, I just thank you so much for the heart of our pastor. God, I just thank you for the words that he spoke this morning. And God, I know they came from a really deep place. And God, I just pray that you would help us to embrace that this morning. God, help us to listen with ears. To him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. God, take our hearts, God, and mold us into the people that you need us to be in this world, God, for this generation, for right now, God. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. And God, we just ask that as we go out of here that, God, you would protect us this week. God, you would give us strength. Lord Jesus, and uh, again, want to lift up Jennifer, God, and we just pray for fast healing for her, God. And I pray right now for strength for Bill as he's caring for her, God. And we just ask right now that you would uh, surround them with your angels. We pray that you would surround them with your presence, God. And thank you so much, God, for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, as you leave, um, I hate to be rude like this, but if you would go ahead and just, if you want to visit with folks, go ahead and go outside and visit. I would like to ask that uh, those of you who feel led, you'd stay and maybe help clean. Uh, we have some rags and some um, bottles back there to, to go around and get things like um, light switches and doorknobs and railings and stuff like that, if you're led. If not, uh, it's okay. Um, but if you, if you stay and want to visit, go ahead and go on out um, either side and, and we'll take care of things. Okay, God bless you. Have a good week.